It's been called the saddest story in rock and roll. With family fallouts between brothers, constant ongoing lawsuits that have lasted decades, epic fights, and royalty disasters, all of which stemmed from a career that only lasted a few short years. We'll bring up the volume today and check out the raw energy, the swampy blues melodies, and the tragic adversity that plagued the band Credence Clearwater Revival. The, the story of Credence Clearwater Revival doesn't begin with ear-splitting guitars and packed stadiums, but rather in the idyllic suburb of El Cerrito, California. In 1959, a group of high school friends who were all passionate about music, singer John Fogarty, brother Tom, Stu Cook the bassist, and Doug Clifford on drums, formed their first band, the Blue Velvets. Even in the early days, John Fogarty was regarded as the band's engine. He had poetic lyrics that were both rough-hewn and portrayed deprivation, social commentary, and the splendor of the American landscape. John, unlike many of his peers, did not retreat from discussing heavy subjects. His lyrical content would eventually speak to a generation that was dealing with social turmoil and the Vietnam War. Yet it was Fogarty's special voice that really made the band stand out. His voice, a gruff emotional rasp, soon became the band's trademark. Through many name changes and eventual reincarnations into a swamp rock act, the band succeeded in obtaining a record contract from Fantasy Records in 1968. It was this early contract signing that's often seen as the first crack in the veneer of the group. Owing to the fact that the four members had no business savvy at the time and were in desperate need of a start in the industry, they signed their early career away in the hopes that this new contract meant a grasp at stardom. But unbeknownst to the group, the contract was heavily skewed in favor of the record label and its owner, Saul Zantz. Signing on the dotted line meant giving Zantz and Fantasy Records a disproportionate share of the band's earnings and creative control over their music. Still though, the first singles from the group were released. Susie Q and I Put a Spell on You are only two amongst many songs that speak for Fogarty's songwriting ability as well as their musicianship. Credence effectively continued the same unstoppable trend of successful albums after that, with quick hits like Proud Mary and Born on the Bayou, proving how the band could effortlessly move from swampy rockers to bluesy ballads. Their next album, Green River, gave yet another slew of top hits like Fortunate Son and Green River. Songs that utilize John's distinct quality of songwriting and authentic instrumentation. Within just a couple of years, CCR were the biggest band on the planet, mesmerizing audiences with their signature style of roots rock and John Fogarty's lyrical and vocal ability. They were a band that truly reflected their time, and their music still appeals to music lovers worldwide. It was around this time that Credence took the opportunity to perform at the now legendary Woodstock Music Festival in 1969. The band were scheduled to perform late on Saturday, August the 16th, following the Grateful Dead. However, due to delays, including logistical issues and disagreements over performance order, CCR didn't take the stage until around 3 a.m. the next day. Despite the late hour, their performance was well received by the audience and the group delivered a memorable set that included hits like Born on the Bayou, Green River, and Suzy Q. The band members by this stage were sitting on top of the musical world, but the facade of solidity began to show through the foundations of Creedence Clearwater Revival. John Fogarty, the undisputed creative mastermind, had written the majority of their music, his songwriting being the fuel for their success. At the same time, the three other band members were looking forward to taking the lead in the actual process and sharing their music and stories. Resentment in their lack of creative control had flourished, and that left John's brother Tom, Stu Cook, and Doug Clifford feeling like hired hands rather than equal partners. Adding to the flames were John Fogarty's strong traits of personality. The singer's songwriting dominance and dictatorship within the band had caused friction amongst all the members. Fogarty had a clear vision of Credence's sound, and any deviation from that vision would be met with firm opposition from the other members. To the other band members who had their own musical preferences and goals, such dominance by John over the artistic direction of the group did not sit well. 
Financial discord then soon put more pressure on the bandmate relationships. Management and publishing deals became a source of disunity, with Fogarty becoming more and more suspicious of the record label, keeping their end of the bargain in paying the band the proper royalties they deserved. By 1970, these suspicions began to boil over when Fogarty filed a lawsuit against Fantasy Records, claiming that the label was miscalculating royalties, and as in so many banned court cases before it, the court case showed disharmony within the group, with the other members arguing that if Fogarty had won the lawsuit, the result would restrict their market revenue and limit the band's creative integrity. The germs of disunity, which had been sprouting in the previous years of the group, were now in full bloom in CCR. The day-to-day -day power games revolving around creative differences, financial struggles, and the never-ending lawsuit with Fantasy Records was just too crushing to bear. The biggest blow, though, came in 1971 when Tom Fogarty, John's older brother and rhythm guitarist of CCR, got fed up with the disunity in the group and left the band. Really what I wanted us to do was take a break, because we were all pretty stressed. The group had initially considered replacing Tom, but decided to continue as a trio. After Tom's departure, the band released the Mardi Gras album, with its biggest hit, Sweet Hitchhiker, reaching number six on the Billboard Hot 100 chart in 1971. The song was one of the band's final hit singles before Fogarty, sadly, and so deeply disenchanted, furious, and bogged down in the lawsuit, had dissolved the band for good. The personal lives of the members of the group were devastated by its breakup. John Fogarty especially felt the pain and the rivalry that followed. The band would be the heart and soul of him as a person and as a professional, so the singer found the dissolution to be both personal and professional in failure. The legal battle with the record label also dragged on, making any hopes of a peaceful settlement even more dim. Any hopes for a full reformation of the band would come to an impossibility when Tom Fogarty, who had not spoken to his brother John in over five years, passed away in September of 1990 due to complications with the AIDS virus, contracted during a blood transfusion for back surgery in the mid-1980s. Tom had moved to Scottsdale, Arizona in the mid-80s, and after a bout of poor physical health, he sought out surgery to cure his back problems. That's where he would undergo an unscreened blood transfusion, which in turn would be a grave mistake, because from this transfusion, the guitarist contracted the AIDS virus. Tom and John were not on speaking terms even then, given the acrimonious split of the band, and sadly, the reconciliation would never happen. Tom Fogarty passed away at the age of 46. At Tom's funeral, his brother John read the eulogy, saying, We wanted to grow up and be musicians. I guess we achieved half of that. Becoming rock and roll stars, we didn't necessarily grow up. Years later, Fogarty wrote in his memoir, I was sad that life had been taken from Tom. That sadness was mixed with other emotions, but I've forgiven Tom. I'm not angry anymore. I love my brother. Also, I sure love the old family days, the way we were as kids. It's resolved, and somehow Tom knows it's all right wherever he is. The court case of John Fogarty vs. Fantasy Records was lengthy and complicated, and it arose after the group disbanded in the early 1970s. It was not a straightforward one about sound royalties, but rather plunged into the murky legal waters of creative ownership and freedom of expression. Fogarty had alleged that Fantasy had been depriving the band of royalties, claiming that the company fraudulently manipulated accounting procedures and incorrectly applied different operating expenses. This financial conflict suddenly boiled over when Fogarty sought legal redress, yet the band's complications had only increased from there. In response to Fogarty's claims, Fantasy Records filed a countersuit questioning the copyright of the singer's own lyrics. The solo work by the singer, entitled The Old Man Down the Road, released in 1985, was the principal subject of the argument. Fantasy declared that the song was an improper variation of Credence's song, Run Through the Jungle. Saul was suing me owning the old song and wanted to own my new song, Old Man Down the Road. With some words changed to make the song sound different. In Fogarty's eyes, the case by this point had become absolutely absurd, with Fantasy attempting to sue John for sounding like John. This case, unfortunately, was never settled out of court, but instead moved relentlessly through the judicial system all the way to a jury trial in 1988. 
In one of rock and roll's most bizarre moments of the 80s, John Fogarty sat in the witness box with a guitar on his lap and explained to the jurors what seemed obvious to the entire courtroom. That two songs, written by the same artist, could sound the same, but yet could still remain wholly different songs. They told me don't go walking snow. The devil's on the loose. In the end, the jury agreed with Fogarty, determining that the two tracks had fallen short of the legal standard for copyright infringement. If Fogarty had felt vindicated, well, his joy would soon be diminished by the $1 million in legal fees that was spent to defend himself against the infringement claim. Had Fantasy Records won their lawsuit, Fogarty would have been required to pay the company's legal fees, and so the songwriter reasoned that the opposite should also apply, that Fantasy should pay the singer's legal fees. After another lengthy, drawn-out appeal, the Supreme Court would rule in Fogarty's favor. I am nothing if not spontaneous. <laughs> it would take until 1993 for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to give justice to CCR, and only then was Creedence Clearwater Revival formally recognized for a formal induction. The esteemed award signified the undeniable impact and recognition of Creedence and their part in music history. Rock legend Bruce Springsteen had the honor of presenting the award to the group, but once again, complexities with the band's history were uncovered some 20 years after their breakup. In his memoir, Fortunate Son, Fogarty looked back on the personal and business conflicts that had kept him from reuniting with his former bandmates to perform at the ceremony. He went on record as saying that he received no support from his CCR bandmates, whom he felt sided with Fantasy Records during the lawsuit years, and the singer had no interest in any kind of reunion. After the bandmates humbly accepted their award that night, only one member remained on stage to perform as Creedence Clearwater Revival. When the time for the performance came, Fogarty was accompanied not by Stu Cook or Doug Clifford, but rather a superstar lineup consisting of Bruce Springsteen and Robbie Robertson from the band. Fogarty kicked off a three-song set with astounding versions of Creedence's songbook classics like Who'll Stop the Rain and Born on the Bayou. And after learning of the snub and the stolen opportunity to perform with their old bandmate, Cook and Clifford confronted Fogarty. Cook quoting Fogarty as telling them at the time, I'm not ever going to play with you again. I hate you. Fogarty interviewed separately also didn't dispute the claim. I told them we're not friends, and it's silly to even entertain the idea of playing together. During the set of songs that Fogarty performed that night, both Cook and Clifford walked out of the auditorium mid-performance, appalled at the treatment by their old high school friend. The story of Creedence Clearwater Revival, whose musical flight attained the heights of stardom, was riddled in internal conflict from day one. From their edgy debut to their time as one of the most popular bands in the late 60s, their musical journey has the power of pure talent, strong songwriting skills, and an undeniable connection between the band and the audience. Creedence Clearwater Revival's rise to fame and then tragic fall is a tale about a remarkable prodigy, unforgettable songs, and unsteady emotions that ruptured a musical organization. Their legacy and the influence of these pathfinders cannot be denied. Their swampy grooves and catchy classic hits are still a staple of radio and streaming playlists today, 50 years after the band is broken up. If you like this video, why not take a look at the tragic and crazy history of the Eagles? Also, comment below and hit that subscribe button so you never miss another video from Project Hysteria. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.